Good evening. My name is Liza Gentile, and I'm a proud JWU alumna and the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations at Johnson & Wales University. Thank you for joining us for our reunion summer wine tasting. We're so excited to bring you this tasting to enjoy in the comfort of your own home. As a special treat, you'll be entered into a drawing to receive a handmade charcuterie board or a coaster set by fellow alum Michael DeQuattro, class of 2008. When the trade show and conference industry shut down due to COVID, Mike used his time at home to turn his woodworking hobby into a business and created 161st Woodshop. Be sure to check him out on social media via the link in the chat window. You'll also be entered into a separate drawing to win a JWU swag bag. While we would have preferred to gather together in person, we can still keep this event as social as possible. With that said, please keep your cameras on during this event, but your mics muted. If you have a question about the wine or anything that's being discussed, please use the raise hand feature located within the participant button. My colleague, Lauren Anderson, manager of alumni relations will moderate tonight's questions. When she sees your hand raised, she will call on you and invite you to turn on your mic and ask your question. If you'd prefer, you can type your question into the chat and she will read it aloud. Lastly, be, be sure to take photos and tag at JWU alumni or use hashtag JWU reunion 21 on social media so we can share. If your account is private, you can DM us with the photos. I'd now like to introduce tonight's presenter. Mark Di Marchena, class of 1988 and 2002 with his master's and is, is an associate professor in the beverage and dining services department, part of the College of Food Innovation and Technology. Mark joined Johnson & Wales University's faculty in 1998 and currently teaches foundation and capstone courses within the beverage world. He's also led study abroad programs for students to Europe, the Azores and Madeira. As a longstanding member of the Society of Wine Educators, Mark serves as a member of their board of directors. He holds the Certified Wine Educator and the Certified Specialist of Spirits Achievements from this organization. Additionally, Mark holds the WSET Level 3 in Wine and Level 2 in Spirits and, is certifi and has certified as a Spirits Trainer for Level 2. Mark's passions for the industries began very early on during his days as a dishwasher and prep cook. Prior to joining the faculty at JWU, Professor Dimar Chenna managed food and beverage operations at a variety of hotels, national parks, and inns across the country. His involvement in the food and beverage industry spans four decades and has afforded him the opportunity to work with great teams creating unique dining moments and profitable businesses. Mark has worked as a consultant to local, local and national hospitality organizations, helping them to drive excellence in their daily operations. Please join me in welcoming Professor DiMarchena. Mark, I'll turn it over to you. It's great that it reminds you to unmute yourself because it'll make the whole presentation that much easier. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Happy Thursday. I hope you all are well reunited or working on continuing your reunited activities. It's great to be here on Thursday with you. I've set a timer, so those of you who have maybe had class with me know that I'll try not to go too long, you know, the game. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Liza and Lauren and Lori and Emma and all the JWU alumni team for their support. It is always great to work with them and to come and celebrate what we know as JWU. Um, I've got some wine, so I want to go through the basics. So I have been a faculty here for, oh my God, 24 years. That's amazing. That's a great place to be. I hope you continue to enjoy your JWU experience. We are in the CCCE building, also known as the Center for Culinary Excellence, the Cuisinart Center for Culinary Excellence. We're in the third floor and there's no one else in this building but us. That's kind of wild. Um, so I've got five bottles of wine. The room is locked. I feel safe. It's gonna be a great time. I hope you enjoy. Please call me a lift at about 8.45. I appreciate that. Um, I hope you are all prepared for some fun because um, wine tasting, I mean, when we talk about wine, when we talk about taking care of customers, making them a great meal, it's really great to know that we are in the pleasure business. We bring pleasure to people at all different levels, whether it be you know QSR, quick service, or fine dining. Um, it's a great thing to do. And one of the easiest ways to do it is to open a bottle of wine. So I would like to just double check that you are prepared because you had to do some homework. 
So you hopefully purchased five wines. Um, so you've got your wines. They should be chilled. Uh, most of our wines tonight are white. We also have a rosé. Uh, if you were in the East Coast over the past three days, you really needed your wine chilled because it was really hot. So uh, I even chilled my red because uh, in the middle of the summer, uh, something with 14% alcohol just isn't as much fun when it's 85 degrees in the bottle. So if you can keep it around 60, that's a lot more fun. Besides that, we're gonna need some glasses. Hopefully you have gone through the intricate procedure of properly opening your bottles. Um, that's awesome. Hopefully there were screw caps there because that makes life so much easier. Did everybody prepare their morsels of delight? Little munchies to co uh, uh, collaborate. If you'd like to bring your morsels to the camera or bring the camera to your morsels, you can show off your uh, food skills, if you will. All right, I can show off, you know. I went to the grocery store. So we have some fun ahead of us. Um, as an old Johnson Wales ism, whether you went to the college or the university, you may know today's date. Well, and I don't mean the physical date, June 10th, but what day of the week are we folks? Thursday, and it's Thirsty Thursday, if you know what I'm saying. So let's get started with Thursday Thursday. It's going to start with this amazing little product. Um, I'm going to bring it close to the camera. Um, I'm not sure if everybody has gotten the Gruet is the French way to say it. Um, even though it doesn't come from France, you'll notice I've already taken the top foil off. Um, I thought it was called Groot, and I thought they were dialing into maybe a great marketing scheme when combined with Guardians of the Galaxy. Imagine if that little tree guy was actually drinking sparkling wine. Think of the gold mine it would have created. Unfortunately, they didn't call me. They missed out, and they're French, so they say Gruet. Ah, such an opportunity missed. So I just wanted to remind, when you're opening a sparkling wine bottle, it's dangerous. This thing's a weapon. Please put your saber down. I know everybody watches YouTube and it's like, look, I'll get my knife out. Yeah, okay. Maybe we could have in our next reunion where we get together, I'm just throwing out this to Liza, if we could get a, a sparkling wine donated, we could all go into the Wildcat Green area and we can do the largest Guinness World Record sabering event at one time. I think the committee should work on that. Sorry, Lauren, if that falls on your desk, but uh, we'll work through that. <laughs> Anywho, as soon as you remove the foil, just make sure your thumb's on top. We call that a safety. Make sure the weapon doesn't cause any problems. And then we need to take that little disc and turn it six half turns counterclockwise. If you're in Britain, that's anti-clockwise. It's a totally different term. If you go clockwise, you won't get any wine. Sorry. So once it's loose, Make a fist over the cork and don't twist the cork, twist the bottle. Oh my God, this thing wants to go. Hold it back. Oh, I failed for today's exam. I got a C plus. Sorry, that was a little aggressive. They've turned off all the ice machines in the building. So I only was able to chill it in the fridge. So a little bit in our glass. Uh, hopefully you all have a little sparkling. Before I talk about the wine a little bit, I just want to say, Santé, which is French to your health. Happy 2021, we're getting into summer, we're moving beyond COVID and that's a good reason to raise a glass of bubble. Cheers to you all. Mm. Okay, now let's talk about that. So there's a French family, the Gruets. They were from the Champagne region in the south of Champagne. And some reason in the 1980s, they said, whoa, what should we do? We should go to New Mexico, huh? And they went to New Mexico and they found that it is a great location to grow grapes. Now, all of us know or presume California was the place to go. I don't know if these guys got on the wrong plane, but what they realized when you think about New Mexico, um, kind of deserty, right? Little sandy, a lot of rocks. But we won't talk about the uh, the weapons testing zone, that's for another conversation. But um, what's amazing is this wine is grown in a higher altitude than any wine in California. 
Most California wines grow between 1,000 and 2,000 feet. This is 4,200 to 5,100 feet. Why is altitude good? Uh, hmm, anyone? Throw it in the chat. See if we've got some past wine students hanging out there. Reasons that altitude is good for grape growing. Come on, peeps. I want to see if you can type and drink. Because it's cool. Way to go, Gail. Thinner air, Emma. What do you mean? Grapes don't need to breathe? Oh, my God. <laughs> Thinner air means we're closer to the sun. I, I see where you're going, Emma. That's cool. That means they get more sunshine. And they do have cool evenings. Right on, Gail. That leads to a long, slow ripening season. So they get a lot of flavor and a lot of development, and we get to capture that in the glass. Um, everybody take a look. I don't know if you've poured enough in your glass. I have to be careful because um, I don't know if lift comes to this building, but we've got a lovely pale gold color, some nice active bubbles. Take a nice deep sniff. See what you're getting in that glass. Why do we sell or drink bubbles at the beginning of our parties? What is that about? I'm going to do a little test to see if the answers at the beginning, when you've only had less than one glass, are different than the answers we get at the end when you've had more than one glass. This is going to be recorded for posterity, and some of you may be hired later. <laughs> It wakes your palate. That's right. I hate that my palate takes the afternoon off and goes to sleep. What the heck was my palate thinking? That's awesome, Sean. That's cool. It definitely, it brings our palate to life. There's good acidity. And as we mentioned, that high altitude and that cooler part of the day helps to preserve the acidity in the grape. It makes it a very refreshing drink. Anyone else know why the bubbles are so good? I was going to do a Michael Buble joke, but then I needed to hold back. Sorry about that. Any Canadians? I didn't mean to offend. Sorry. Wow. So we're stuck with it wakes your palate up. The bubbles, and I try not to tell the freshman, sophomore, junior, or seniors this very often. It does clear your digestive tract. That's interesting, Diane. Um, that means you can eat more. Um, bubbles bring alcohol to your body's um, you know, circulatory system faster than any other beverage. So it gets us to relax. At the beginning of a party, we're a little nervous. We might see that person we dated a couple of years ago and we don't wanna see him again. You know, oh, it could get awkward. And it helps us relax. One or two glasses. If you're doing the whole bottle, that's a separate conversation. Please put your phone down and don't let people record. So how do you like your wine? Would you be able to tell if this was in a blind, if a blind tasting, if someone poured two glasses of bubbles and you had what we're tasting in the first and a French champagne in the right, would you be able to tell the difference? And I think this is a very well-made um, French style. And when I say that, you can look at the label and see that they have these, uh, you got the Gruet word, then you've got these tiny words, méthode champagnoise. And that's the cool thing for $15, this bottle, this process was done in the bottle. It's the classic way to make champagne or sparkling wines. You can, of course, make the bubbles in a large tank, which is very much what you see with Prosecco. And that's why it's usually quite inexpensive, but still tasty. Um, but this is handcrafted like you would find in champagne. Um, they can't say champagne on the bottle because then those French lawyers show up and they are very persnickety. Oh, monsieur, we must talk about the label. Oh, the problem is champagne, no? Anyway, I hope you enjoy the Gruet. It is definitely put New Mexico on my travel plans. Um, the, the folks who do this, uh, it's a family interest. They started by opening their own vineyard. They grew about 30 acres. Then they got out of the growing business and focused purely on the wine business. They started way back in 84 which really was the wine renaissance for the United States. It, it took about eight years after the judgment of 1976, the judgment of Paris, when things really started kicking in. Um, very exciting, definitely cool to, uh, to go to New Mexico and see some of this lovely bubbly. There are other wineries, there are over 50 wineries in New Mexico, so definitely worth the trip. Um, one last sip. 
Mark Gale would say that this is lighter and maybe more refreshing too. Than the champagne? Correct. It, yeah, and then I don't know if you, what fruit comes to mind with everybody. Um, sometimes when you hit the bubbles, they sort of take the lead, but when you're sipping it, does it make you think of anything specific? Yeah, apple is screaming. It's and it's really ripe, yummy apple. So I think that's a sign of all the wonderful sunshine they're finding in New Mexico. Kind of fun. What are you going to eat with that, folks? Anything. I'm sorry. Did I say anything? I'm sorry. <laughs> Bubbly wine is just a, a reason to eat food. Period. <laughs> And feel free to use the reaction or if you want to physically raise your hand, I can have you um, unmute if you want to speak your replies as well. And then if I really get aggressive, I can call on people, Lauren. I'm like, uh, Lisa Tomasulo, you've been a little quiet today. I'm a little concerned about that. Um, <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> Mark. Awesome, awesome. She and I were TAs and fellows together way back in 1980. Oh, God. 586. That's crazy. Or 86, 87, maybe. So pears, you're going to eat pears with it, Emma? It definitely smells like pears. I agree. Um, some people might like this with sushi, whether it's the traditional with the nori kombu on it or more of a sashimi. Um, I like it with just the, you know, the tuna on the rice, and that's a pretty happy place and keeps things fresh and clean. So thank you, Bubbly World. Thank you, Gruway. And where are we in the alcohol world? Yeah, 12%. So it's very easy to handle, although those bubbles can sneak up onto you. If I fall off the stool, please call security. The number is 598-1130. Thank you again for Flying United. So second glass, you're going to need your passport, please. We are going to skip customs and go right to Portugal. You notice something happened to my bottle. It's bigger. So... Does anyone ever buy Magnums just because you can? It's not a bad gig, especially if you like the wine and you have a way to preserve. I know for the champagne or the sparkling wine, I have a special top that you can insert and then it locks around the neck and that will help keep the gas inside the sparkling wine for a couple of days. So you can enjoy it each morning with mimosas for breakfast, which is always good. So wine number two, we are gonna leave the United States and we are going to Portugal. So Lauren, does this show up backwards on the screen because, or does it come out all right? It comes out all right. Okay, cool. Sometimes with this Zoom technology, you're not sure which way it's going. So Avaleda is a family producer in the Northwest of Portugal. Um, this wine, it's a little confusing. They have the word font. Um, and I think that's more of a, just sort of a brand name, a sub brand, if you will, but the wine is named after its place. And this wine's name is Vino Verde. If you're from the Northeast, uh, it's a very popular Portuguese uh, choice to drink. And I apologize, I snuck ahead and I opened it and you'll just take a look at the cork. I mean, I opened it about 10, 15 minutes ago and you can see how the cork swelled or sort of released because they actually use a cork that is much thicker than is needed. Because in the old days when Vino Verde was finished bottling or finished being produced, they bottled it pretty quickly. So when it went into the bottle, the secret gas known as carbon dioxide went with it. And often your wines had a little spritzy character. Um, so traditionally you would see this. In today's world, um, they may add a little CO2, like shoot it with a little CO2 as they bottled so it can seem authentic. Um, it, this one did a little pop. I can see some little bubbles at the top right now. So Vino Verde is a place you can actually drive through it. Um, and it's in the Northwest of Portugal, the very top, what is a, a region called the Minho. So all of you can practice your Portuguese. I want the H to come out like gnocchi. So Minho, come on, everybody out loud, Minho! Sorry, just got a little carried away there. You know, it's wine. It does that. So glass number two is the Vino Verde. Two grapes you may not be very familiar with. And you can see as I just poured it, it's a little spritzy. You have a twist off, Jenny. That's okay. And Gail's friend, our bottle is screw top. That's okay. I think, you know, you probably found this to be a pretty inexpensive wine. 
And for most wine producers, um, that screw cap is definitely a, you know, a very functional way for them to survive. So I'm gonna put my cork back on top. So my little spritzes, I can see a little foam air bubble ring at the top. It's got a rich green gold color. That's okay. I mean, you know, you didn't have to find the Avaleda. That's totally cool. Um, the real key is finding the Vino Verde. Then you know you're in the style game. Um, the grapes that you're gonna see here are kind of different. They may not be what you're familiar with every day. Um, you have Alvarino. Again, there's an H in there, so you got to go Gnocchi land, Alvarino. And then you also have Lorairo. Um, two really cool grapes. They do really well in this port of, part of Portugal. This part of Portugal gets more rain than any other part of Portugal. It's very close to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, I think I want to go there and go swimming. I think that would be good. And drinking Dino Verde, simul well, you can't drink while you're swimming. But when you come out of the water, maybe enjoy a little bit. So when I uh, look down on this, again, a little bit greener tone and color, um, meaning uh, it, it's, it's a little fresher, younger in its expression. Um, Vino Verde is not something you, hey, let's wait 20 years and see if it's better. Mm -mm, don't do that. Please don't do that. Please buy it, drink it. That's also what the screw cap says. Any, any wine that has a screw cap, it's really meant to like, hey, we should drink this now. So when you get home, please. Yeah, you get the point. So when I smell this, and if you take a big whiff, because this area is the wettest part of Portugal, often in the old days, uh, when farming was a little more, hey, what are you doing versus what am I doing? They would actually train the vines up trees or along per pergolas to keep it away from the ground because as a wet region, the ground held a lot of moisture. And all of us who make believe in our mind that we're growing grapes know that moisture causes rot and the grape, grape vines don't like that. So <clears throat> there's a little clever trick. You'd see these vines growing up the, the trunks of trees. And you're like, what is that? It's a Tarzan movie gone bad in Portugal. Anywho, I'm getting a lot of floral. It's making me think I, I just walked into Yankee Candle Potpourri section and somebody lit a candle. I need to run for the door. Um, but it's, it's kind of cool. It's very fresh, very easy. Go ahead and take a sip, see what you think. Santé. I'm gonna use my spit cup from now and then because again, Lyft said they don't come to this address. But anywho, I did one of these tastings in December, three sparkling wines, and I'm like, I should have applied the spit cup. Anywho, what do you think? Is it lighter or heavier than wine number one? Right on, Haley. Right on, Raymond. Good job. Um, so very, very simple wine. It's just friendly. It's fresh. You know, on a hot, hot day like we just survived might be a great way to just refresh yourself. Um, this could be easily consumed on its own. Um, you've got to be very careful. Your food isn't super intense with this because it could overshadow the wine itself. Are you getting the floral character? I'm glad some of you are liking this. That's great. That's a great way to call it, Lisa. We call it patio wine. Not for when you're redoing the patio, but when the patio is done and you're just chilling. Um, just make sure it's nice and cold. And I think you'd find this totally refreshing on any hot summer day. I'm not drinking this in the middle of the winter in New England. He's like, hmm, something's missing. Awesome. Cool. So that's two nice little fun white wines. We bounce from New Mexico to Portugal. Oh my God. Now we have to get on a really long flight. 12, 14 hour flight. We've got to go to New Zealand. I like you all to take a moment and see if you can talk with a New Zealand accent. I like to see if you can communicate in another way. I don't know. I just could be Australian. I've done this accent with Australians and they say, you sound like a Kiwi. So now I know. Those guys, they're a tough crowd. I'm gonna put those to the side. 
Any questions about the Vino Verde, the Alvaleda? Uh, Alvaleda also makes a wide variety of other wines. Uh, uh, the Gruet also does still wine besides some high-end um, vintage sparkling wine. Each of these houses that we selected tonight provide, provide a variety of choices that you can have fun with. So we're gonna go to the South Island. I know you all know New Zealand has two islands, right? The North Island and the South Island. Students love that question on the study test. It's like, oh, two islands, North, South, I got that. So at the very top edge of the South Island, you have this region called, where is it? Oh my God, there are little squiggly lines. It's called Marlborough. And it's, <laughs> unfortunately, I hear the word Marlborough, I think of like cigarettes in the 70s. So ugh, throw that away. This is a way better Marlborough than anything I've seen here. So really great, great. And I was gonna say cool because it is a very cool climate location. So the straight, uh, Captain Cook Strait goes between the North Island and the South Island. And this has a couple little valleys that sit in Marlboro that really, New Zealand was not on the wine map uh, 40 years ago. It wasn't until the 80s or 90s, they dialed into Sauvignon Blanc specifically and they hit a home run, specifically Marlboro. Um, they make some other fabulous wines, but Sauvignon Blanc is what New Zealand is really well known for. Until that time, the Sauvignon Blanc that was unoaked and not impacted by wood, you would go to France for. You would look for something called a Sancerre, which is really neat and unique, but it's very minerally. It's completely different than this. This cool growing region really allows Sauvignon Blanc to express its ultimate character. Um, makes me think of a really intense ruby red grapefruit, sometimes tomato vine, herbaceous character, really fun. I love this kind of top. Everybody do the screw cap between the thumb and index and then twist the bottom, boom, you're done. Isn't that great? I love that. This guy or gal, whoever invented that thing, they need to get a Nobel Peace Prize. Oh my God. This, this has a great question. I'm sorry, Mark. Say again. Uh, yeah. There's an alumni trip, alumni abroad to New Zealand in 2022. And yeah. she asked if this vineyard is on that trip list. So definitely something to look at. I mean, we'll be probably close to it, I hope so. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the list, but I'll be glad to take a peek. And uh, I'd be glad to be the host tour guide. <laughs> so we have a New Zealand alumni trip. Why don't you tell faculty this stuff? You shouldn't keep secrets like that. Anyway. I'll send you the website link, don't worry. Awesome, awesome. And uh, I'll take a look and see if there's any particular wineries we can identify. Um, I mean, you have wineries on the North Island and South Island. Um, so I, I would think this is a pretty strong tourist destination. Uh, they say uh, the family, so the wine's name is Whitehaven. You can find um, many, many Sauvignon Blancs in your local liquor store. Um, we've been using this in class. Uh, it was donated to us by the Gallo folks um, for most of our education. So it's a great example of um, Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. So Whitehaven, the, um, Greg and Sue White, I guess they had nothing better to do. So they went on their sailboat for two years and they put in at this part of New Zealand to take a little time off of the waves. They fell in love with Marlboro. So what do you do after you sail for two years? Let's open a winery. And they opened a winery and they named it White Haven and, you know, after their family name. Um, and it's a lovely little expression of Sauvignon Blanc, pretty reasonably priced. So go ahead and pour that in your glass. And again, we're still pretty light yellow green in color. You'll notice that spritzy character we found in the Vito Verde is gone. So we've posted the link to the study abroad. Oh my God, I'm an alumni. I need to take a look at that. I wonder if the Dean will let me off that semester. Anywho, um, if you take this and bring it to your nose, I would like you all to do some typing and just First impression, what's the first thing this smell makes you think of? Oh, that's cool, I like that. Under ripe peach or ripe, or like juicy ripe? Okay, grapefruit, you're not saying enough. I need yellow or ruby. Apple? Ah, ruby, pink, that's right. Under ripe on the peach, good, I like that. 
Yeah, I, I think you're totally right. Um, if anyone's growing tomato plants right now, run outside, grab the leaf of the tomato plant, rub it in your fingers, bring it to your nose. Sometimes I also get uh, green tomato vine, but this one is definitely screaming ruby, uh, ruby red grapefruit. So yummy. Does that smell make you want to take a sip? Yes, that's what I thought. So andiamo, santé. Mm. I don't, I'm sorry. I wasn't able to spit. I went there, but didn't happen. Don't know what happened. So, so, so easy to drink. Does anyone find this too tart? After you swallow, you'll find that your mouth might start to salivate underneath the tongue. Nope, we love it. <laughs> it says, we've got a big score from Emma and the alumni relations. Awesome. It's so easy to drink, it's very friendly. It is 13% alcohol. So, I mean, right at the medium zone, totally so good. Um, and what's tricky about Sauvignon Blanc, I mean, you can find it all around the world. I mean, it originated in France. And then of course, as a grape, it did really well traveling. So, but as it goes to each place, it really starts to take on unique character. Like I find the California style Sauvignon Blancs do not present this way. They always were a little more grassy or make me think of uh, stray, uh, stray, straw, <laughs> a horse barn kind of straw, where the New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs just scream this fresh tropical fruit and a little bit of that herbaceous tomato. Super crisp and clean. Thank you, Dion. Um, oh, you drink Oyster Bay, madame. So nice. You like this smoother though, Lisa. That's cool. Awesome. Of course, the biggest name is probably the Cloudy Bay. It's just a little further east from where, Mar uh, where this is made in Marlboro um, and literally has a really strong impact of fog. And again, it helps to keep the grapes cool in a really sunny place. Apparently, New Zealand's sun is um, sort of precocious. It likes to hide in the fog and the clouds pretty, uh, pretty distinctly. So this part of Marlboro has mountainsides on the north, west, and south. So it has a pocket. And one of the videos I was watching yesterday, <laughs> the grape grower called it, uh, it actually has a hole in the sky, meaning it's one of the few places in New Zealand that gets regular sunshine, which again, allows the grapes to get their peak ripeness, but also the cooling impact of the fog allows it to preserve the fruit character and really drive it home. So I think it's time for another sip. Whew, too much talking. Is the flavor the same as what you smell? Is it some, something different? I mean, does anyone still get grapefruit on the palate? And I could just, uh, drinking this is great, but I also love just snipping it. Now it's the same for many of you. That's cool. Does anyone get a new flavor? Uh, we often associate what we smell and flavors as similar items. And we try not to confuse them with our five tastes. So this is a second quiz point of the evening. This is where you're gonna write the five tastes. Come on peeps. It's not just drinking night. <laughs> Oh, Thirsty Thursday. Never mind. Come on, where are my five? I got pineapple. That's awesome. Green apple, but you still get the grapefruit. Nice job. Thank you, Ray and Lisa. It's like really ripe pineapple. I can see where you're going with that. Where are my five tastes, people? You're starting, you're getting involved in the food too much. Oh, I should have some food. I like that. All right, people don't want to talk about taste. Sour, thank you, Lauren. Congratulations for starting the ball. So a buttery affinois, salt, thank you. Oh, Richard, you're going for the big score. Sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and you said it, umami. That's totally cool. And we all have different levels of sensitivity. Um, if you've got nothing to do on a Saturday night or a Monday morning or, a, or while you're at work, um, go to my vino type, M-Y-V-I-N-O dot type. And he's got a little, this guy, um, 
oh god i lost his name uh george george not george howell mixing up but anyways he's got this cool little survey three question survey and it tries to classify where you are on the venotype scale and you know we all have different sensitivity to bitterness Supposedly, our mom uh, helped decide that during her first trimester of pregnancy. If she had a higher level of morning sickness, the child has a higher sensitivity to bitterness. So now you can all go and call your mom and say, hey, mom, did you throw up a lot in the first you know, the TMI, right? Anywho, so I'm going to do a rich, buttery affinois from France. So it's like a brie, almost, a, almost like a double, double cream and a little bit of French bread. This is a seafood portion of the class. Sorry, the seafood food oating joke. Sorry, bad. Can't help myself. So when I think about food and wine pairing, the main thing I try to think about is how does the food change the wine? Because all these items here, also provide your five tastes in some sort of quantity. If I look at the affinois, it's very fatty, maybe a hint of salt, no acidity, maybe a little bitterness from the rind. Those taste impacts will impact or affect the taste impacts of the wine. So I think the pairings that we like usually guide the wine um, or change the wine in a way that's beneficial to us. They say the easiest pairing guides to consider are foods that are sour and foods that are salty. Those are usually the easiest to pair with wines because they usually turn wines into the taste profile that we preserve, that we prefer. So if I see Captain Tomato, I'm saying, here's a guy who's gonna make, bring sour to the game. And if, if you have a tomato in front of you on your plate, this is a great wine to do this with. You take a little tomato or look on your tasting venue and search out something that might be sour. Put the food in your mouth, crunch it all around, and then pour the wine through the food. So I believe the sour in the tomato made the sour in the wine diminish. And then the fruit character of the wine got bigger. And not that it got sweet and sugary, but it got more fruity and is um, kind of enjoyable. So break out the tomato bruschetta and good luck. So Whitehaven is a fun place to go. They also make an outrageous Pinot Noir. Uh, Marlboro is not really the place you would go for Pinot Noir. If you head further south on the South Island, there's this wine region called Centro Otago and very mountainous and uh, very, it's, it's cooler than Marlboro, but really well suited to growing Pinot Noir um, and just a great new world expression of that grape, something that would be fun to do. So hopefully the alumni trip also goes to Central Otago Marlboro, then crosses the Captain Cook Strait and heads up to Giz, uh, Hawks Bay, Gisborne. There's there's a couple spaces. If if they need advice, I can write out some ideas. So, who's in charge of that, Lauren? Oh, thank you, Tim Hanai. Who posted that, Lauren Anderson? You're a goddess. I did. It's uh, it's in collaboration with JMU Global. Oh, the global people. I know their phone number. Awesome. So we're rounding the bend. We've had a couple wine, uh, wines. We've had a bubbly and two whites. Would you agree that the second white is heavier body, a little fuller body than the first? Or I'm sorry, than the than the vino verde. So when you're arranging a tasting, it's very good to set it up going from lightest to heaviest. So I, I apologize. I sent out the tasting sheet, and I think I just got circleitis. And I like, oh, let me arrange the numbers. And I got a little crazy and I put them in a weird order. But I always try to think of arranging lightest to heaviest. Um, and it, it allows each wine to really show itself properly. And let us see. So Mr. Charles Smith, did anybody look this guy up? 
I mean, if you go to um, Charles Smith Winery and look up his picture, the dude, he's probably in his 50s, but he's got really, really, really tight, blonde, curly hair. And, and the hair goes like out to here. You're like, clearly he was, and I mean, the bottle suggests it, but he was a rock and roll band manager in Europe for a couple bands in Europe. And that's how he developed his love for wine after the concert or maybe before, I'm not sure when they eat dinner, but traveling in Europe with band members, having dinner with wine. The guy fell in love with wine um, on a trip back to the United States. He was in Washington and said, whoa, you've got some great opportunity here. Um, wine is primarily grown in the eastern side of Washington. If you fly to uh, fabulous Seattle, you have to go east about four hours. You have to go over the Cascade Mountains. You get a great view of some of the beautiful uh, snow-capped volcanoes that make up the Cascades. And then you hit this massive desert. And I, I was there um, about 15, 20 years ago. And it's just, it's just amazing. You would not think you could grow grapes here. And water is a challenge. So whoever has water rights to the land has the possibility of you know, establishing a vineyard. Um, Irrigation is essential. So Charles Smith grows a variety of wines from the Columbia Valley. You notice on his label, he only says Washington State. And what I can only presume is that he may be bringing grapes in from some other parts of the primary place. I mean, in Washington State, the Columbia Valley really makes 95, 96% of all the wine or all the grapes that are grown there. So Yankee Spirits Baby. Okay, Gail, are you, are you selling other uh, liquor distributors? I love that. Okay, so the screw cop again, nice and easy to open. Um, so rosé wine has to be made from red grapes or green grapes? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Something, something economics? Yes, only red. Green grapes can only make white wine. Red grapes can make white, red, rosé. It's that power grape thing. Of course, when you make a red wine, you typically soak the juice with the skins because the color is completely in the skin and you need to extract that color, that fancy word. Anyone feel like typing anthocyanin? It's a cool word. It's awesome at cocktail parties. People walk away from you when you bring up the term anthocyanin. I don't know why. It's a great term. Anyhow, so if you let the, uh, the skins or the wine soak for a short time, you can get a tiny bit of color. Who's buying wine at Target? What's going on here, people, Raymond? He's down in Texas, so he has the benefit of- Oh, that's wine not Target. right, Raymond. My Target doesn't service me that well. It was the only one that wasn't at our wine store. <laughs> but you could go to Target and still get it. That's awesome. <laughs> That is so cool. I am jealous. Um, you know, I, I want the small wine stores to be able to, be, you know, be successful. But sometimes to be able to have access like that is just mind blowing. I was in California last week celebrating my niece's uh, high school grad. And of course, I went to Costco. And I'm like, holy wine stores, Batman. This is insane. My uh, brother-in-law ushered me out very quickly, knowing that I could not fill my bag enough to go on the plane. So Band of Roses, Light Rosé from Washington State. Um, I think he, this guy must not like colors. All of his labels are black and white like this. He's got the uh, Kung Fu Girl, the, um, the Velvet Devil, which is all about super rich Merlot. So he's having a lot of fun. And, then, and again, I think that's the thing to remember when enjoying wine or drinks with friends and buddies is that it's all about pleasure. So I think that's the second time I've said that tonight. I hope you're still counting. So we'll get a little bit of color in here. So if you're taking an official wine class, rosés are classified as either pink or orange. Where would you go with this? Or with the wine that you have, even if you bought it in Texas? Pink, awesome. So I think the pink represents the fresher style, you know, the younger wine. Most wines as they age or as they sit in the bottle will go from 
um, a base color to more of a brown. So when I think of pink with a little brown in it, I get orange. I think I remember that from first grade. They sort of said pink and brown equals orange. But uh, so that would mean it would be a little more, it sat in, sat in your wine rack a little too long. Rosés are usually meant to just buy and consume. What, anyone have a cool aroma when you smell that? I know Lauren's enjoying the Anchor and Hope. They're an awesome little company in East Providence. They actually bring in containers of wine and then bottle it here in Rhode Island. Pretty amazing. One of our grads is working there as a sales rep. You're getting honey, banana, so some tropicalness, awesome. Some peachy peach. A little bit of cherry, awesome. And go ahead and take a sip, santé. I noticed some of you are pre-sippers. You don't even wait, you just sort of dive right in. I'm a little concerned about you. You guys, you know, oh my God, you're that group of students in class. I'd have to like, hey, put the glass down. Step away from the glass. You need to take a break, sonny. Well, some of those non-spitters, you got to watch out for those students. Oh my God. So as a rosé, I know the world fell in love with rosé in the early 80s, or at least the United States did, thanks to our friends at Sutter Home when they made a mistake with some Zinfandel and realized, what are we gonna do with all this pink wine? And they started a bit of a craze. And then somewhere we all got snobby and it's like, oh, I don't drink Sutter Home, it's so sweet, oh my. And it's like, hey, enjoy the wine that you enjoy. It leads to enjoyment, if you know what I mean. So this is a dry style rosé. I think it's aromatics are a lot lighter than where we came from uh, the Whitehaven folks where the smells really attacked you out of the glass. Um, I think the cherry and the red fruits are there. Sutter Home rocks. Hey, it all rocks. Mark, so Lisa Dyson dry... brought up something, I'm sorry, Go about ro rosé being made two different ways as far as short exposure um, to red skin or adding red red wine to white wine. Can you talk a little bit about the different ways to make the rosé? So yes. So I mean, you, you, so there is the soaking time, which is the classic way. And then there's something called saigné, which means to bleed. So um, when you're starting a fermentation, uh, red wines are crushed. That way the skin and the juice are separated and allowed to sit together in a tank. And then the longer the amount of time they sit, the more color transfers to the liquid. So if after say 20 hours of soaking, you bleed out, meaning you open the valve and saigne the liquid, you will have a light colored wine. That is probably the most classic way that um, rosés are made. In certain places like the Champagne region, you know you can buy a rosé champagne. Champagne is, and, and wherever you make a bubbly wine, usually it's a region where it's the first grape that's picked in the season. So that means it's, it's, for it to be that crisp, you're, bought, you're picking it when it's just a tiny bit under ripe. So it doesn't have a ton of flavor to hide any overpressing. So in the Champagne region, they will make a traditional sparkling wine and add red wine, something called bouzy, and they'll use that as a more gentle way to add color. Most people do either a crush and press and then just run it through or a short quantity of soaking time. When we were in uh, Bordeaux, France doing our tutor training, some of the Bordeaux makers literally will crush the grape and, and not even let it soak. Just in the short crushing activity, they will get color transfer. Others who want a darker, I mean, if, when you're in Bordeaux, um, the, uh, a deeper red uh, rosé is called a claire, and it's a sub-style between dark red and white wines uh, and rosés, and it's, it's traditional to Bordeaux, and that longer soak time helps to provide that uh, clarity. Um, I hope that helps. Thank you for the cool question. That's awesome. Um, so there's always a little bit more work done when you're making a rosé. Um, but in, you know, in the new world where the rules are a lot more wide open, 
I could definitely see people saying, hey, let me take some of my leftover juice and mix it together and make something magical. Now, I think the trick with Sutter Home is clearly, if you look at the label or you just taste it in the glass, it tastes sweeter. And if you look at the label, you'll notice it only has about 8% <laughs> alcohol factor. Sorry, that's, I use that joke in class. I actually had a student at the end of one trimester, like Mr. DiMarchena, we don't know when they're real hiccups or not. It's like, dude, I don't hiccup. You've been fooled for the whole trimester. That kid, he got an A. He was really good. No, anyways. Um, so I think rosé is a lot of fun. Um, I think the rosé you're drinking, Lauren, does it say where it's from? Is it Deutschland or is it Austria? Um, Rheinhessen, so I'm going to say German. Ah, this is on Deutscher Rheinhessen. Yes, gut. You gotta, I mean, the Germans, you know, it's, it's a cold climate. So it's really hard for their parts of their, their wine growing to actually ripen reds, but they make some amazing. And I say amazing because they're really crisp. So they go with a lot of foods. Um, they make some amazing rosés and the same thing. And when you're in the liquor store or in your boutique wine store, look for a German rosé, look for an Austrian, um, just some lovely stuff. Um, it's quite a treat. Also upstate New York. Hmm, how we going, Finger Lakes? Yeah, how you doing? How you doing? So I'm at 12 minutes. That means I have one more wine to do. That's right. This timer thing is helpful. Thank you very much. So I hope you enjoyed the rosé. There's so many rosés to choose from. It's a little confusing. When I went to the liquor store, there's like a wall of rosé. Does anyone know the most famous rosé wine region in France that we'd really often people look for immediately? Also the part of, uh, or the name of some famous um, travel books in France. Oh, the Côte de Rhone, you can get some good rosé. There's the, yeah, the lovely region Tavel, um, but right next to Côte de Rhone. Ah, voilà, guerre du go, voilà, le Provence, c'est bon. We get our lavender and we get our rosé. Ah. And hopefully we get some great food as well. But this is what was so great about wine. Even if we can't get to Provence or we can't get to Portugal, we can definitely bring it home. And it's it just, you know, you can take a little break from the world very easily. So we've done bubbles, white, white, and rosé. So, wow, that's sunlight. I guess the sun is setting. So I'll go over here. Hola, señores y señoritas. Buenas noches. ¿Cómo estás? Mida, hablamos Melbrick de Mendoza, Argentina. Muy bien, eh? Sí, perfecto. Uh, someday I'm going to study Spanish and get better at that. So we are going to take a hard turn at Albuquerque. That's not a New Mexico joke. That's actually a Bugs Bunny joke. I hope you can work with that. And we're going to head way south. I have not had the opportunity of going to South America. It is on the list. Um, the Alamos folks is a um, sort of a entry level brand, very easy on the price point, but has a great sort of heritage because it belongs to the Zapata family or the Catania family. And the Catanias are one of the original uh, wine families uh, that really started the wine uh, movement in Argentina, if you will, at least the quality wine movement. The family moved from Italy. And within four years of moving to Argentina, started making uh, wine in Argentina. Probably the best known wine region of Argentina is Mendoza. It's, uh, I can't wait to go someday. Um, yeah, Argentina, it just brings a lot of beautiful wine um, to the glass. And you have to think about it. Uh, you're gonna find the winemaking is really far, far, far away from the coast. You're working inland and you're, the view must be beautiful. I can only imagine. Um, the Andes Mountains snow capped through most of the year in the background when you look west. And then again, you're going to find dry desert farming. Um, the Argentinians like to highlight they are all about altitude. Uh, most of their vineyards are in the 3,000 to 4,000 level. They actually have a vineyard at 9,800 feet. It's the highest vineyard in the world. Uh, pretty amazing. Um, these, uh, tonight's wine is more in the 3000 foot level. Again, we're going to get really great sunshine connection. 
We're going to have fabulous um, cool nights in the desert condition. And the thing I really didn't mention with the desert is you usually have great drainage. Grape vines do not like to have wet feet, if you know what I mean. They like to have their roots dry. You need just enough water to keep them happy um, growing, not really focusing on making vine, but focusing on making grapes. So um, this is the 2019 Alamos Malbec from Mendoza. And um, I, we're gonna take a little hard turn going from light, delicate flavors to sort of more of a power juice, if you will. Oh, that little ring sound. That was nice. I don't know if you guys got that, but anyways. So I leave it in the sunshine. That's a little tough, but anyways. So immediately massive amount of color. Um, and what would you call that color, gang? Is this red? Is this burgundy? Is this purple? Burgundy. Yeah, that's a tough word. Oh, you guys are living in burgundy land. And I shouldn't have used that word. All the French in Burgundy are yelling at me right now. Oh, sacre bleu, what do you do? Because Burgundy is a place, and we generally teach to avoid that as a color. Mine's really purpley. Uh, garnet, that's the word, Lisa. Thank you very much. Um, mine has a lot of purple tone. Usually red wines that are purple are demonstrating their youth. They're younger. And as wines age in the bottle or at the winery, they will develop more of those brown tones going from purple to garnet to actually uh, tawny. So, wow, totally different smells. I'd love to see what you're getting. Is it fruit? Is it something other than fruit? What's talking to you? Yep, the cherries. Oh, butter. I like you got butter in there. And who can name the winemaking process that brings butter to wine? Come on, people. Three letters. That's the abbreviation. Blackberry, that's great. You definitely also get the oak impact. It's very soft, maybe a hint of vanilla in the background. Definitely the baking spice character. Oaking, I like that. That means the oak is continuing to capture you, draw you into the glass. Awesome. So there's so much going on here. It's, it seems like a great value for a $9 bottle of wine. Cool. When you say tobacco, Lisa, are we talking um, we're in a pipe uh, sort of tobacco store or is it like the fresh leaf drying? Sorry, I, I get picky. I'm sorry about that. It's like, oh my God, I just wanted to say tobacco. God, you people are so pushy. Oh, cool. You're in the pipe store. So you get a little of that fruit smell as well. So wines can get a butter or dairy character because the winemaker will do a procedure called malolactic fermentation, MLF. And it's a way to take the acids that are in wine and soften them. When they do that, they add a, a bacteria called lactobacillus and it converts uh, malic acid to lactic acid. And of course, lactic yeah, we're going to go for the moo sound and you, you start going into dairy land and it's pretty cool. Um, so there's like there is this fatty sort of hint of butter note on the outside of this wine. Go ahead and take a sip. Santé to you. <clears throat> I noticed most of you are sippers but not slurpers. I'm a little concerned about this. I don't know, when you put the wine in your mouth, I have an excessive problem with it. I mean, early on in my eHarmony dates, I had a couple of people it's like, is there a reason you gurgle the water? And I'm like, dude, I teach wine. You need to just chill out and I'm, this date is over. But um, it was also kind of embarrassing. It's like, I didn't know I did that. Anywho, so when you breathe in over it, it's awesome because it really opens the flavor. Um, and you know, in the wine world, it's pretty acceptable. Mark, can you talk a little bit about aerating versus decanting red wines? Slurping, aerating, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, ah, nice crossover, Lauren, I love that. So yeah, I mean, so first of all, when you taste this, would you all, I mean, I, I see some people wrote uh, very complex, 
But um, the first thing that screams, I think, is the fruit. It's like super, super intense fruit character. And that's that unbelievable sunshine in Argentina and the cool nights preserving that fruit. Because if, if it was you know, pretty warm like our summers on the East Coast, that fruit would start to cook and you might go to more of a jammy character. This is really bright, fresh fruit. Chocolate with slurping, that's a whole nother game. Um, <clears throat> so wines, it, it's challenging. Some wines need a little air to sort of activate uh, after they sat in the bottle for a period of time, they need to come and sort of wake up. So you can always, you can do this with a white, you can do this with a red, you can pour it. I know a lot of us pour it into the glass and we're like, oh, we'll let it breathe. The old way of letting it breathe was you took the cork out, it sat on the table for an hour or so. But this hole is so small, you really question how much breathing is going on. So much better to take a carafe or decanter and pour your wine into that. And then it's going to, of course, expose all the wine to air. And the oxygen is going to help the wine to release some of its flavors, aromas, and character. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I don't know if anyone's ever done that where you've poured a wine with dinner, put the cork on it. So in that process, air has gotten in the bottle and then you've had it the next day. And you actually like, I, I like the flavor the next day a little bit better than I did the first day. It was like more alive or more evolved. So the decanter is a quick way to do it. And then of course, if you wanted to pour it back in the bottle and save some because you weren't drinking it all, that's totally fine. The interaction with this auction has is, is been activated. So it will continue in the bottle. Um, I, I, I have one of those little aerators where you attach it to the top of the bottle and it has some kind of mechanism. So air is inserted. I was actually, I was making a, um, what do you call those? Um, a protein drink this morning and I had a little a little blender and I was like, I wonder if I should blend wine tonight. I was like, some people, I, there, there's a YouTube video where someone's taking a whole bottle of red wine, put it in a blender and zapped it. And the idea is it uh, the aeration helps to reduce, what's that puckery feeling we all receive when we have a red wine more than a white wine? Lauren, you can't answer this. What's that puckery feeling people? I didn't get any answers with the MLF. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Lisa. Lisa, you are now the, the 100 point scale. I'm very proud you're getting the, the super points. Um, excellent people. Nice job uh, dialing in, Gana, uh, Gail. Um, although Tannen has two ends, Gail, I'm a little concerned. So anyways, we'll work on that. <laughs> oh, look at that. She's like, oh, <laughs> that's so awesome. Um, so it, if you have wine to waste and you've got nothing better to do, do the blender test, or at least go to YouTube and look up the blender wine test. Um, so it, it can get crazy, but air helps to soften and wake up your wine. Um, and it's, it's a fun way to explore. Wines that have been you know, sitting and resting for a longer period of time will need that decanting to wake them up and bring them to life. And of course, a very old wine, especially red, so does anyone remember the A word that I used? Oh my God, Lauren, I'm down to seconds. Four, three, two, anyways. You're fine, don't worry, Mark. Ah, oh, thank you, boss. Does anyone remember the color word that I used uh, that comes in the grape skin? Tannin comes in the grape skin. Great job, Gail. Great job, Lisa. But with that, you also get that anthocyanin, the key cocktail party word that people just love. And um, so anthocyanins, in the winemaking, we trick them to attach to the liquid. But over time, after sitting in the bottle, so I've got two bottles and I feel like I'm play, playing the drums here. This is awesome. But after a certain amount of time, the little molecules start to uh, lose or change their electric charge and they combine. So the anthocyanins get heavier and they don't want to stay embedded in the liquid. So you know, older red wines have sediment. The sediment is the collection of those color molecules. And what's the A word? Antho, cyan. Okay, dude, you need to get off this, man. I, it's been a, only a month of summer, but I'm dying to go back to the material, you know, guys? So the third reason people decant is because uh, they want to separate the sediments in the older wines. Um, some people don't mind them being in them. Is the word of the night. Thank you, Lauren. That's excellent. 
So why has the alcohol level seemed to increase? The, the global warming question, oh my God. Um, are, are we farming better so that our grapes are being harvested in a, a riper condition? Um, it, it's funny, if people are still debating global warming, you just could go to anyone who's had a vineyard for the past 60 years and recognize, um, I was in Italy a couple summers ago, and the, the, the grape grower himself was saying how his grapes are riper. Now, there are things the farmer can do to try and control how quickly the grapes ripen and how much sunshine they capture. But um, I think people also think, you know, full-bodiedness, that power that some red wines bring is a way to evaluate quality. So um, I think some winemakers will present that. What is this? This is 13.5. So I would put that in the medium to high medium in alcohol. Most wines, they can range anywhere from 5% alcohol to 21%. But most table wines that we drink are somewhere between 11 and a half and 14 and a half. But you're, I think you're totally right. You're seeing more and more of the scale creeping up into 13s to 15s. You get a nice, super rich red Zinfandel from California, and it can be it can be easily 15. The key is, did the winemaker make it so it was balanced? So, how'd you like the Malbec? Where did that grape originally come from? Is it indigenous to Argentina? Oh man, I didn't know there was gonna be test questions. Ooh, Spain, nice idea. Um, so. Malbec originally comes from Bordeaux, France. Right on, nice job, Gail. So um, someone had a question about Pinot Grigio. So you, uh, when you say Pinot Grigio, I can't see who that was, Lauren. Uh, um, I might have sent oh, it to I'm... you directly. I don't see that question, but we do have time for some questions. So if you have okay. any questions for Mark, feel free to send them to me or put them in the chat and I will read them to Mark. Um, so he's answering them and not reading them. You just but, gave away that I don't know how to read. That's really not. No, no, no. I don't want you to. Yeah. I don't want you to be distracted. No worries. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to drive and drink. Ooh. <laughs> well, we have one to start off with as well. But what is one of your favorite varieties? Allison is wondering. Oh man, Allison, it's like uh, when er everyone goes to culinary school. Everyone asks them, "What's your favorite food to cook?" You know, mm -hmm. so much of it is about mood in the moment, and like, what am I eating, or what am I drinking, or what am I doing? So I, I do find I drink more white wine than red. Um, I just love, I'm an acid freak. That's right. I drank vinegar as a kid. Can't help it. Just love the Wicked Tat. The Wicked Tat thing is just so freaking cool. It's better than Dak Bia, if you know what I mean. Um, so uh, right now I buy this really inexpensive. It's about $14 a bottle. It's called Ferment. Um, so it's one of the three grapes that makes a famous dessert wine called Tokai. But when it stands on its own, it can also be made into a dry wine. So, and, and the wine is called Love Over Money. Um, and it's, so it's kind of a romantic thing. Um, it's got some weird Hungarian word on the front. I'm like, what the heck is that? But apparently it means love over money. So, um, and it's just fun. It's very, I like minerally wines, um, you know, but... You know, I have some Spanish heritage, so it's fun to try Albariño. Um, I very rarely buy the same thing on a regular basis. I like to explore. So, um, I mean, Pinot Gris from Oregon, very exciting. Um, different style than, say, the Italian Pinot Grigio, but very, very fun. Awesome. I, hope that, I hope that helps. <laughs> My favorite kind of wine is open wine. So that's what I would say. Oh, man. <laughs> um, we have some more questions. And this one kind of uh, goes into Ray's question. But how long can you keep white and red wine once it's been opened? All right. So, I mean, the, you know, typically, if you take a white wine, you don't do anything to it. You put the cork in, put it in the fridge. You know, it's going to immediately start changing because air has gotten in, gotten in there. But, you know, is that change so bad that it ruins your day? Um, so I'm thinking a white wine um, probably lasts shorter than a red wine. Red wine has more characters to protect it. Usually it's a little higher alcohol. I think the tannins also act as an antioxidant. So, um, it, but if you're not doing anything, 
um, you know, three to four days on a white in the fridge, um, four to five days on a red. But there's this this product. There's numerous products, and it's either nitrogen or argon gas, and it comes in a little can. You swear that you got ripped off because the can is it feels like it's empty. It's so light, but you literally go into the top of the bottle and go two spritz and then the cork will make that bottle last two weeks. So, I mean, there's a variety of products on the market. It's, it's just argon gas. And because the argon is lighter than air, it sits in the bottle at the liquid level and it keeps the bottle, uh, the wine from interacting with air. So there's really no reason for anyone to sort of deal with, uh, you know, wine that just didn't last. Um, I mean, because, you know, I, even though I teach it, I teach wine, spirits, coffee, um, beer, I, I am a lightweight. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, it's really hard to finish a whole bottle. It's like things get awkward. Anyways, so yeah. I hope that helps. Um, so what's the next great undiscovered or underappreciated wine region in your opinion? Oh, boy. I mean, is... Everybody feels Spain has been discovered enough. Um, so you wonder that I mean, Greece has some really cool red wines up in the northern part uh, of Greece. And I mean, everybody thinks Greece is all about white wine, but uh, the Greeks and it's kind of odd to say discovering Greece. Like, weren't they some of the first people doing this? Uh, hello. <laughs> so the circle just goes round and round. It's kind of funny. Um, so I think you would have a lot of fun, you know, it'd be, it'll be very interesting to explore. I've had a couple of wines from India, um, you know, India and China are really coming online. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what they bring to the game. I love South Africa, um, has some fun stuff, especially the sparklers. They're called Cape classics and they're, that means they're made in the traditional way, the champenoise method of making bubbles but the, they have that really ripe character that you're going to find in a new world country. Awesome. Lisa's curious, how does salty food change the wine profile? So um, we all know why we go to fast food restaurants for French fries, right? Nobody's lying to anyone here. You, you know, you'll stand in line, you'll get in the drive through because you're craving that French fry. What makes that French fry so good? Mr. Salt. So salt hides bitterness. So if your steak, um, if you're having your steak with this lovely Malbec and you have not seasoned your steak, you're not bringing salt to the game. So if salt comes to the game, it will hide the bitter character. I don't know if you wanna go back to your Malbec. But distinctly, when you go to red wine, what are you tasting right now? I mean, generally wines will not bring salt as a character and generally they're not really gonna bring umami. So that means wines are gonna present sour, sweet or bitter. So which of those three is biggest in the red wine? I think it's bitter. Even though they're these fruit characters that sort of disguise the bitterness for a minute. But the great part about food that has a salty tone, so if we take a piece of prosciutto, a prosciutto di Parma, molto eccellente, eh, bravo, Zabata, bravo. Um, you're gonna embed the salt, up. Oh, Gail's shown off. She's like, I got prosciutto right here, so don't even talk to me. But um, the salt is going to subtly downplay the bitter in the wine. And so when you hide the bitter, the other elements might get bigger or more noticeable on your palate. So the fruity character that the wine already has inherently may speak to you in a louder way. And, you know, that's just a balancing. The hard part is that we're all different. Uh, as I learned more about food and wine pairing, it really made me consider how hard a chef job is. Because, you know, you're often driven by your own palate, but you have to consider all the people you're cooking for. It's a pretty amazing skill. Great. So we have a couple more questions that I want to. I'm so through. sorry. I, 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 I cannot ask some more questions. I just overwhelming. I'm being a, 
Okay. You're the expert here. Everyone's curious to tap into your knowledge expert. and your passion. This is an unknown factor. And spurt is a drip coming out of a faucet. Thank you very much for calling me that. Good oh, Lord. Um, so Richard is curious, what do you think of, um, about the variety of blend wines? So I, mean, I think blends bring, uh, first of all, blends, you know, make some of the most expensive wines in the world. When you think of Bordeaux, um, it's the land of blends. And, you know, even though Napa really focuses on naming the grape inside uh, the bottle they give you, I mean, do we all know that when the grape name is on the label in the United States, that wine only needs to have 75% of that grape to actually take that name. So that means you could be most of the wines that we're drinking are blends. They just don't have to share that with us. But of course, Bordeaux is the classic blending place in the world. Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and Merlot are the original powerhouses. And then sometimes Petit Verdot and um, Melbeck will also bring up the game. And the idea is, it's just like maybe when you're seasoning your food. Um, do you just put the main protein out there with nothing on it? Or do you add layers with salt, garlic powder, a little bit of, you know, I've actually done this odd thing. I, I did a umami class with um, the Lee Kum Ki um, sort of soy sauce producer. And, you know, when you make a Manhattan, you've got bourbon, sweet vermouth, and then uh, people add dashes of bitters. I've been experimenting with a dash of soy, soy sauce bringing a little bit of saltiness to hide the bitterness from the, bitten, from the bourbon as a way to make the drink sort of rounder. So um, I think blends are great because um, you also see um, red blends at the value level and it's gonna bring more character to the game. And so I think uh, even at the low price end as well as the high price end, it, it's a very cool thing. Um, Terry Yan is curious if you tried any Virginia wines and what your opinion on them are, if you have. Well, I was just speaking with my old boss, Ed Corey, um, who um, uh, is visiting some of our uh, Charlotte faculty, uh, Sarah Malik and Catherine Rabb. And um, Sarah actually has been posting on her Facebook. Uh, Ed had recommended some Virginia wines to enjoy. Um, I have not had, a, I don't know if I've had any Virginia wine. Um, so I know they're doing some really great things um, in, the, in the East Coast of the United States. You know, we had Eric the Red show up here in 1000 AD and he saw all the vines and he's like, Vinland, Vinland. And he's like thinking they're gonna make all this great wine. And then the pilgrims, they didn't want wine. I don't know what their problem was, but then, you know, all these evolutions of people come to our coast and they're like, we need to make wine. We didn't know there was a little bug in the dirt called phylloxera who really destroyed the, 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 the base uh, grapevine that came from Europe. The vines that grew here in the United States make grapes, but it's a different flavor set and they're not really well suited um, to making fine wine. But um, in the 1880s, we figured out how to um, splice two different species of grapes together and graft them so that they can survive. And you know now it's just suiting the right grape to the right location to deal with. It's amazing how much moisture the East Coast is compared to the West Coast. And with that moisture comes all these challenges in farming. But the Virginians are really, really making some great improvements. And I, I think it's an exciting place to travel. I got a hand, Fantastic. nice hand. Yeah, we'll have Lisa, if you'd like to unmute, if you want to ask your question. Go for it, Lisa, bring the game, Lisa. You can do it. Oh, she's like, no, I'm not talking, please. No, no, no. She did offer to have you come visit her in Virginia, though. So that is oh, that. cool, cool, cool. Where are we in Virginia? Okay. I... <laughs> I'm in you Alexandria. Like I didn't mean to raise my hand, but yeah, come visit. <laughs> Sounds like a good road trip. Thank oh. you very much. Awesome. All right, we have a couple more questions and then we will close out. Um, but Audra is- I, I need, which wine would everybody go back to out of the five wines mm -hmm. and you say you've poured all five, who, what, which wine, and you can just throw a number into the chat board, which okay. one would you go back to right now? Ooh, Cal's going, Clay's going right for the five. Ooh. 
Sauvignon Blanc is currently in the lead with two to one. We've got a one for five, one for three, we one for two. Wow. Everyone, all five are chosen. Wow. That's, that's good. Choices. That's a nice diversity. Yeah. The room just off the grill. Way to go, Clay. I like <laughs> your timing plan. Bravo. Uh, what's your address? I need to drive over. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so Audra is curious about Pinot Grigio and the many food options that it goes with. Um, do you have any recommendations on Pinot Grigio as far as the tasting of fruit? being more forward in the, in the Pinot Grigio uh, variety. All right, so Pinot Grigio is, um, you know, when we taste wines with students, we usually, we, we build up between the classic, you know, white grapes and red grapes. So we'll go Riesling, we'll go Sauvignon Blanc, do a Pinot Grigio, and then work into Chardonnay um, as wine styles. Um, and Pinot Grigio can be really tricky in a lot of ways, because you can see it when it's high production, um, like the classic um, Italian Pinot Grigio that is, you know, 10 to $15 a bottle uh, and Santa Margarita for 24. Hello, don't need to do that. Um, anywho, and you know, it's, it's, I always think it's sort of lemony, limey. Um, it, I always equate it as like a baby Chardonnay. It's like, it wants to be a Chardonnay, but it's slightly different. Uh, of course, it doesn't ever have malolactic fermentation. It's really about fresh fruit. Um, what I think is, uh, a place to explore is the northern part of Italy. So if you're near Lake Garda and you head north in between Verona and Austria, apparently I'm throwing corks now, so it's, it's that part of the evening, but between Austria and Verona is the, you know, during historically you had the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which controlled that part of Italy. And Pinot Grigio loves those cold mountain sort of regions. And I, I think you'd find that's really exciting stuff, super bright, crisp. But then there's also this style, the same grape, Pinot Grigio, is also the grape Pinot Gris. It's just the Italian word for gray, Grigio, and the, Ita the French word for gray, Gris. And so you can go to Alsace in Eastern France and experience Pinot Gris there. And I think you'll find it's like richer, heavier body, maybe not as sharp, uh, maybe more minerally. And then what's really cool is Oregon sort of copies or imitates Pinot Gris making in their own way um, with the beautiful sunshine of the Willamette Valley. And it's really all these different expressions. And then of course, you know, you have Pinot Grigio made in the high volume area. Apparently the building just turned off the lights and they're trying to kick me out. I'm not sure what's happening there, but... Uh, <laughs> So I literally have my one workshop lamp here in the dining room. I hope this isn't scary, but it's just kind of funky, but, um, and shiny all of a sudden, but, um, so many choices. And I would say it's a light to medium bodied wine. So, I mean, um, sauteed fish, sauteed chicken, um, you know, medium to light intensity foods, uh, are easy to win great with scallops. So I don't know, Audrey, uh, is there more I can say about that for you? Awesome, wonderful. So we have a couple more questions, probably some quick answers just so we can uh, wrap up uh, Did shortly you say I here. need to answer more shortly? That was really kind of rude. Yeah, I mean, that's, would, no, yeah. that's okay. There's it's a couple like, questions that we, um, that who teaches the WSET courses on the Providence campus? Is it a particular person? So uh, Elise, uh, she's uh, one of the owners of the Coast Guard House. Um, she teaches our adult ed programs for the Wine Spirits Education Trust. Um, I did recently look on the web. I don't think our schedule is up yet, but we are offering the level two and the level three, uh, both in the fall and the spring semesters. Does everybody know that we now are semesters and not trimesters? It's like, oh my God. 11 weeks was great compared to 16. <laughs> so anywho, so consider you're lucky as an alumni, you're all done. Absolutely. And so we'll close out with a preferential question for you, Mark. What is your preferred current wine region and why? Oh boy. So first of all, we are with our new Dean, Jason Evans, exploring adding more adult programs. Um, uh, it's like wine tastings, food and wine pairings, et cetera. 
um, here on the Providence campus. Uh, so it's something to keep your eye out for. So preferred region, oh boy. Um, you know, I love Italy. Uh, um, when we were in Verona, I mean, Valpolicella is just one of my favorites because it makes all these different styles. Um, I, I have a, you know, I am really, I lean to the old world. I, I just love exploring um, the older regions. I don't know if it's because I dig history or what, but Valpolicella in the northeast of Italy, of course, you have Veneto, which is a big region there, but Valpolicella is this little village on your way to Lake Garda from Verona. And um, they make easy, super simple $10 bottle of wine just called Valpolicella. Of course, the word Valley of Many Cellars is what it translates to. So apparently they're making wine there for quite a while. But then you can get something called Ripasso, where they take the base wine and run it through the grape skins that were left over from their most famous wine called Amarone. And the Amarone is like 65 to $100 a bottle. And they actually put the grapes when they're harvested on shelves and they let them dry for a couple of months. So water sort of you know, evaporates out of the grape and it creates this super intense wine. Um, originally Amarone was a sweet wine, but then someone goofed in the wine cellar and didn't check it. And then they like, hey, the dry stuff's pretty good too. So, um, so you can have Amarone della Vopolacella, your Ripasso della Vopolacella, and good old Del Polacella. You can go 10, 25, 65, and really not have to leave Italy. It's awesome. I hope that helps. Fantastic. Thank you for all of your answers, Mark. Thank you for your uh, passion. I'm going to turn it over to Lori Zavada, Director of Alumni Relations, to close us out. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you, Professor DiMarchana, for such an entertaining and informative tasting, as always. We're so grateful to you for sharing your time and extensive knowledge with us and appreciate all that you've taught us. I don't know about you, but I definitely felt as if we were all together. Thank you all for that. Special thanks to Gail Solomon from Design Services for our beautiful tasting mat for tonight's session, as well as all of our branded items for this year's reunion. We hope you all love the look of this year's reunion as much as we did. Thank you to all of our alumni in attendance tonight. Your registration for this event not only allowed you to celebrate reunion with your fellow alums, but also directly impact today's Wildcats. The donations you made when registering will be put to work immediately to support students and educators at JWU. Donations to the JWU Fund, like yours, are unrestricted and allow us to say yes to upgrades, enhancements, and new ideas, as well as urgent needs on all JWU campuses. And as an alumni donor, you also contribute to the growth of JWU's reputation, which increases the value of your own JWU degree. If you'd like to give an additional gift, please click the link in the chat window. Thank you again for your generosity. We sincerely hope that you enjoyed this summer wine tasting as part of reunion week. Don't forget to visit alumni owned and operated restaurants in your community this weekend for JWU Eats. The full list of participating restaurants can be found on our website at alumni.jwu.edu or via the link in the chat. It's our hope to resume in-person events in the coming months, and we can't wait to see you. I hope you'll plan to return to campus for a reunion 2022 next June. Have a wonderful e evening and good night.